All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the East Bay Regional Park District Board Operations Committee. Today is Tuesday, April 11th, and it is 1237. So the East Bay Regional Park District intends to hold meetings through a hybrid platform of in-person and remote attendance to allow members of the public to participate via remote attendance through the Park District's virtual platform, Zoom. Uh, the Board of Directors and designated staff with limited exceptions, participate in person at the Park District Headquarters, which is here at 2950 Prop Oaks Court, Oakland, California. And occasionally, members of the Board of Directors may re attend remotely pursuant to the Brown Act as amended by AB 2449. Members of the public can listen and view the meeting in the following way, uh, via the Park District's live audio stream, which can be found at HTTPS, YouTube, Y-O-U-T-U dot B-E forward slash P-N-M-L-O-R 5X dash Q4. There's a bunch of stuff in there. <laughs> so uh, parties with facilities and meetings comply with the American Disabilities Act. If special accommodations are needed you, for you to participate, please contact the clerk of the board at 510-544-2020 as soon as possible but preferably at least three working days prior to any meeting. Denise, can you tell how the public can um, participate today? Yes, so members of the public wishing to make a public comment may do so by joining live via Zoom, via email at boardopscommittee at ebparts.org or via voicemail as noted on the agenda located on the Park District website. Great, and then... Um, Will we hear public comments at the end or at the end of each item? Yep. So can we go ahead and do a roll call, please? Yes. Director Corbett? Here. Director Sam Wong? Here. Chair Rosario? Here. AGM Gordian? Here. And staff presenters today include Renee Patterson, Ruby Tumber, and Jeff Manley. Excellent. With that, uh, we will begin with uh, item number two. Authorization to amend and extend the Castle Rock Arabian Special Use Agreement, Dialdo Foothills Regional Park. Welcome, Renee. Thank you, Director Rosario. That's ready. Thank you for your patience. I'm very good at this kind of thing. So, um, good afternoon. My name is Renee Patterson. I'm an admin analyst in business services. And today we're here to get a full, to go to the full board to amend the Castle Rock Arabian Special Use Agreement for an extension of five years. So uh, the Castle Rock Arabian Special Use Agreement, we're going to go over the location, uh, what is a special use, uh, a little background of the previous agreement, um, the revenue, and then I'll ask for the recommendation. So the location is in Diablo Foothills in the area called Castle Rock Regional Recreation Area. It's a formally uh, sort of an enclosed area that we used to do uh, with concessionaires for picnics. So similar to Little Hills. And this arena was um, created during that previous concessionaire use. So um, 
the satellite picture gives you a better indication of where it's located within Castle Rock Recreation Area. It's right next to that graveled parking lot. It's about four acres. Um, the farther one shows you the distance between um, the person who runs the arena, which is um, Castle Rock Arabians, and her business location is that yellow dot. So special use agreements um, must meet district objectives with appropriate public benefit and priority. So when we do a special use agreement, we're looking for those attributes. It's defined as any ongoing recreational development activity service or land use that is provided for group and general public benefit by clubs, associations, or similar groups operating as a nonprofit entity with membership open to the public. So currently the district has 28 special use agreements and the type ranges from archery, swimming clubs, uh, equestrian groups, scouting, horticulture, et cetera. So um, a little bit of background on Ms. DuPont. She owns Castle Rock Arabians and uh, she's been there since 1971. She has a lifetime involvement with horses, including dressage, Western pleasure, and competitive trail. And um, I've asked, I've been asked in previous um, practices for this, what is Western pleasure? So I looked it up. It's a Western style competition at horse shows that evaluates horses on manners and suitability of the horse for a relaxed and slow but collected gait cadence along with calm and responsive disposition. So the horse is to appear to be a pleasure to ride smooth, moving, and very comfortable. Pardon me? I'm. Oh, you can see my paper? Okay. <laughs> So the Castle Rocks has operated a summer program teaching riding lessons, uh, horsemanship and children through the use of the horse arena and paddocks in Diablo Foothills Regional Park since April of 2000. They, the, as I said before, the previous concessionaire also used this arena. They were the ones that actually sort of flattened that area out. There were some paddocks and other areas for pony, pony rides and things like that. Um, that you know, that disappeared as of 2000, that's no longer there. So the um, public arena is also used by local equestrians if they sign up through Miss DuPont, which we've allowed her to sort of control that. Um, the current five-year special use agreement with the district expires on June 30th, 2022. So this is um, a close-up picture of the arena. Uh, Ms. DuPont and her staff keep this arena leveled. Um, we don't dictate their, um, man their maintenance of it, but it's supposed to look like this all the time. So um, they may need to go in there daily when they're doing camps there every day. But I think in general, they do it maybe once a week or twice a month or something like that um, in other times of the year. So they work with the park supervisor um, on any issues that might come up there. And we get $100 annually for this special use. So the staff rec recommendations, district staff is recommending that the board operations committee approve and recommend to the full board a five-year extension for the special use agreement with Nancy DuPont, who does business as Castle Rock Arabians, beginning May 1st, 2023 for continued seasonal use and year-round maintenance of the special use area known as the Castle Rock Arena in Diablo Foothills Regional Park with an annual use fee of $100 with no cost to the district. 
And I saw that today we have the uh, unit manager, Bridget Calvi, with us. So she not only is the unit manager of that park, but she was the previous park supervisor there, and she has worked directly with Ms. DuPont. So do you have any questions? Either Bridget and I, or I, or Lisa, or Ruby? Bridget, would you <laughs> like here to, to answer. Bridget, would you like to uh, say a few words? Oh, Sergio's here as well. I'll invite uh, comments from either Bridget or Sergio. Hi, uh, this is Bridget Calvi. I'm not sure if y'all can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, great. Hey, um, yeah, I have no further comments. I definitely worked alongside Nancy. We did a big cleanup when I was managing um, Diablo Foothills. Um, but it is a pretty low key operation. Um, Nancy's been part of that community for you know many decades at this point. Um, and yeah, she's very responsive if we need her to um, address any concerns. Um, she's you know a neighbor of the park, so she's in the park a, a lot of the times, at least when I was there, um, hiking and walking her dogs. Um, and then the horses, uh, the neighboring communities, I mean, yeah, they're passing by that area quite often. So I have no other comments unless there's questions. Thank you. Um, it seems pretty straightforward. So I don't really have a lot of in-depth questions. Um, I, I guess my only question is, do we have a lot of other agreements that are similar to this one with this type of um, special use fee in this range of $100? There's two other standalone arenas in the district that we lease. Um, one is attached so to speak, to the Skyline Equestrian Center. And so we just enveloped it. Actually, we enveloped it in the Piedmont Stables Agreement because it's actually in Redwood Park and not, but it's across the street from Skyline. Fortunately, the concessionaire uh, runs both locations. And so we just enveloped it into her regular concession agreement. The other one is um, what's currently called Tri-City Horsemen's Association Arena at the Martinez Shoreline. And that one has a little bit of a higher um, use fee, it's $300 per year because they um, have more of a commercial activity there um, and that they hold more events and um, they like sell t shirts and things like that there. So um, they have like big. I forget what they're called, but they're I'm thinking grandstands, but they're not grandstands. They're like bleacher okay. sort of portable sort of bleacher things. Area. Yeah. And so um, they pay a little bit more, but they also uh, have to take care of the arena themselves. And and like, okay. as in this one at um, Diablo, they, uh, the, oh, I'm forgetting the term, the bars that enclose the arena are, belong to the person who sets up the arena and maintains the arena. There, it's nothing there is ours, except for the land. And when we say maintain arena, so I know we've been talking a lot about the recent storms. If there was some sort of storm damage, that would then be the responsibility of the concessionaire to fix? Yes, and replace sand, if sand washed away or something like that, they would be uh, responsible for replacing it. Mm -hmm. It seems pretty straightforward and it's nice to, you know, support, you know, different types of equestrian uses. I know that there's a lot of equestrian enthusiasts throughout the park district. So it's nice to know about this one and the other two. So thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. All right, good questions. Dr. Corbett. Um, I've had the opportunity to take a look at this in the past and approve it and uh, it looks great. Um, can we have a little more information about the um, agreement uh, included uh, the small ring and three paddocks um, I guess are no longer being used? Mm -hmm. Can you uh, tell us more about why? Sure. 
the original agreement that we had with the concessionaire who used to run a little picnic park, if you will, um, where they had pony rides and things like that, they were the ones that set up this paddock area that ran alongside the road. And then they had the arena. When um, Ms. DuPont took it over, she uh, increased the size of the arena and we asked her, her to remove the paddock area because we wanted to do some work there and create a trail and things like that, which she did. But she missed having the paddocks. And so at one point she asked uh, the business services manager if she could set up a little paddock area and, we, and she did, but then we were charging her more and she didn't want to pay more. So then she removed all the paddock areas so that she could just have the arena and pay the hundred dollar fee. All right. And uh, any other things here that you should tell us about? Otherwise it looks like it's going well. No, she works really well. I I'm assuming because I haven't heard anything bad from Sergio or Bridget that she works really well with park staff. And because she is a really close by neighbor, she's always there. It's not, she's not two cities away or something, or, you know, only coming there when, when she's using it or something like that. She's keeping an eye on it pretty much daily. And she seems to be a very uh, popular place for people to go. Uh, I don't know. I'd rather have Sergio answer that. <laughs> Hi, board of directors. Yeah, it they are very active uh, facility as far as the amount of kids and and activity lessons that they have going pretty much on a daily basis. I would say they're probably one of the more active uh, facilities where they're they're giving lessons on just about every single day when I when I drive by and they are they are a very good neighbor she has an assistant and also a a couple of assistants that help her to maintain teach lessons and to help you know guide the kids when they're when they're giving lessons and riding through the park so uh it's been a positive relationship thus far in my 4 years at the park great thanks for that good news Okay, and then um, uh, I'm assuming that a concessionaire, she provides her own equipment to maintain that facility? Yes. Great. Right. And then is the arena open to the public? I know Redwood, the Redwood Arena across from Skyline Ranch is open to the public when that's not used by the concessionaire. Sergio is nodding his head yes. Yes. Okay, great. Good. And uh, are those hours posted? Yes, that's, that's correct. Mm. Great. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's all the questions I had. It sounds like this is a great concessionaire and it really provides a, a good service to the public. Anything to introduce there? Okay, great. So I, um, a motion is in order. Moved by Do Director Corbett. I'll second. Second by Director San Juan. Roll call vote, please. Director San Juan. Yes. Director Corbett. Aye. Chair Rosario. All right. So great. Unanimous. And that brings us to item number three, uh, approval of new agreement for Lake Anza food concession, Tilden Regional Park. Welcome, Ruby. that again with the microphone. Hi, good, good afternoon, Board Operations Committee. I'm Ruby Tumber, Acting Business Services Manager. 
I'm seeking a recommendation today to the full board of directors for the approval of a new agreement at the Lake Anza food concession. For this pre presentation, I'll provide an overview of the location and background of this concession, as well as the RFP timeline and process for the selection, ending with our recommendation, their term fees and projected revenue. This concession is located within Tilden Regional Park adjacent to Lake Anza and its Sandy Beach. This is within or just outside of the Berkeley city limits close to other Tilden amenities, such as the Tilden Nature Area, the Merry-Go-Round and the Golf Course. This concession is in operation when the lake is open. The Lake Anza Food Concession is a small food facility historically offering snacks such as hot dogs, nachos, ice cream, chips and candy, all those lovely things you want on a summer day. As I said before, the concession is open for the swim season and approximately 37,000 people on average pay to swim at the lake each year. Unfortunately, the lake has been closed in recent years due to blue-green algae, and this has been the case since 2019 but it is expected to be fully operational for the 2023 swim season. We will be having a soft opening at the end of this month, uh, open just on weekends until we are fully operational beginning Memorial Day weekend. Next, I'll be going over the RFP timeline. Uh, we had a little bit of hiccups along the way. We first opened this proposal on December 15th of last year and originally slated the required site visit to occur on January 12th with the due date of proposals on January 19th. Unfortunately, during that first open period, we did not receive any RFPs. So we extended the timeline for a due date on February 2nd with a mandatory site visit previous to that on January 22nd. We had hoped to interview with bidders on the week of February 8th, and I had originally slated for this to come to BOC in March. However, we are coming to you today on April 11th with hopefully going to the full board of directors on May 2nd. And this was a nice photo that uh, Renee had found, a watercolor from an abstract expressionist, Howard Margolis, um, circa 1960s. A little bit more about our RFP process. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned before, we had some challenges with this one. Uh, but that isn't to say we didn't put in an earnest effort to garner as many responses as we could. We posted this RFP on our website, in a legal ad, uh, multiple times on social media, things like Facebook and LinkedIn. I had reached out to local business uh, bureaus and communities to see if anyone had interest in operating the concession. Unfortunately, because we received no RFPs for the required site walk, we did not receive any qualified bidders. During this time, we, however, did receive an informal inquiry from the neighboring concessionaire who manages the merry-go-round. After seeking approval from legal, we engaged in direct negotiation with them as other efforts to receive bids were not fruitful despite our numerous efforts. This concession, as you may be familiar, is Sycamore Concessions Corporation. They provide food service and management of the Tilden Mary Ground Concession, and they've been doing so since 2014. They're experienced with working with us as a partner of the Park District and providing the public with services while maintaining a facility. One bonus of having them manage this concession is it's just up the street and they can share existing staff between the two locations. And we understand from the previous concessionaire that staffing this location was quite a challenge. Uh, for this uh, process, they will be required to submit a sustainability plan to reduce waste for this concession within 90 days of award of contract. I've included um, just a smattering of the different offerings that they are intend to provide at the snack stand at Lake Anza. Just an example, um, they will not provide any plastic silverware, only compostable upon request. And all items are as compostable as they can be, paper straws, 
They will only provide bulk condiments with paper cups. So there's not excess waste from little plastic packets. And uh, we're working with them for a water option that isn't single use plastic. And we've recommended um, there's things on the market such as glass, aluminum, or boxes for water. Water is a popular item, understandably, on a summer day. For this agreement, we are offering an initial two-year term. It's a new concession at this location, so it is a shorter term than I think you're used to seeing. We will be collecting 2% in concession fees of revenue, and 2% will be going into the concession maintenance fund. This is an estimated payment of about $1,400 in each of those two things, concession fees and CMF fees, during the summer season. With that said, the Park District recommends that the Board Operations Committee approve and recommend to the full board the selection of Sycamore Concessions Corporation with the new agreement for the Lake Anza Food Concession with a two-year term beginning May 1st, 2023 with fees based on percentage of gross receipts. This includes 2% into the concession maintenance fund and 2% in concession fees. There will be no cost to the park district for the maintenance or repairs to this property not covered. Excuse me, let me say that again. There will be no cost to the park district for this action except for any unknown cost of maintenance or repairs to the property not covered by the concessionaire or their concession maintenance fund. And today, I believe I, I, I did see unit manager Dan Sykes as well as. I'm not sure if I saw Park Supervisor Sarah Motley, but I do have the Kwasnickis here. They are the owners of Sycamore Concessions Incorporated. So if you have any questions for them as well, hopefully they can answer. I see both Sarah and um, Dan. Dan, would you like to say a few words? As well, I'll give an opportunity to Sarah as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair Rosario, members of the board of uh, committee. Um, I, I'm actually, um, I'm very excited about this opportunity to try out um, this new, or this existing concessionaire in a new location. Um, Kwasnickis have, um, I've had the opportunity to work with them for several years in this position. And um, they have been very responsive and took, have taken good care of the merry-go-round. So. I'm very interested to see how they do with uh, this new concession opportunity just down the street. Um, and uh, as uh, Ruby noted, yeah, uh, staffing has been um, uh, trying to get um, seasonal staffing to come in and work at this location in a remote location has been a, a, a challenge for the past concessionaire. And so um, I'm, I'm hopeful that with being able to um, utilize uh, some of their existing staff that um, they can share from the merry-go-round that, that will help stabilize that situation. Thank you. Sarah, can you add any, would you like to add anything? Um, I just would echo uh, what Dan just said. And um, I've been working with um, Doreen um, for, you know, the whole time I've been here and it's been, she's been very responsive. And um, so I, I think they're gonna do great out there. I think it's a real benefit to have them so close, you know, five minute drive. Um, yeah, I think it'll, I think it'll be great. Thank you. Okay, questions from the board. Direct, I'll go to my left, Director Corbett. Uh, just some comments. Um, looks wonderful. I can't wait to get down there and get an ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for putting that together. Um, and I'm looking forward to how it goes. I'm sure it looks like it's gonna be very successful. Thank you for putting that all together. It looks good. Great, Director San Juan. I'd love to join you for that ice cream cone, by the way. That sounds so appealing. Thanks for kind of giving that visualization. Let's do that. Okay. Um, yes, I, I have a few comments and questions mixed in. I guess I'll start with my question. So I, I saw on the slide deck um, about providing the three stream waistband that Park District will provide that. I'm curious in terms of waste pickup, how does that work in a park like Tilton Park? Do we do that 
within operations or does a local um, waste management company in the city of Berkeley do that? And it's okay if we don't have the answer right now. I'm just curious. Sarah, do you, I, th I believe the park does the pickup. She's nodding yes. So it goes um, into this, the waste management of Tilden Park. And that's handled by a specified contract with the waste management company, whose name I do not know off the top of my head, but you know, we have a specific Bay contract. Cities. Bay Cities, thank you. But we, we would go to the bins and then it gets aggregated and then Bay Cities will come and pick up or does Bay Cities go around to each of the individual bins? Sarah, we, could you answer that? We pull, you know, the individual bins and put them in the, in the big, uh, dumpsters there, and then we pull the dumpsters out from the complex, and then they pick up on a on a regular schedule. Helpful, thank you very much. Um, and then I I, I do think I, I do appreciate the comments about you know the previous concessionaire and some of the challenges with the remote location, and probably also having the swim season closed. Um, since summer of 2019 because of blue-green algae. And I know that blue-green algae comes up a lot in, in many of our other parks. Maybe this might be something that we'll discuss in the next item. Or, and if not the next item, um, maybe at some point in the future, it might be helpful to, to review blue-green algae. Uh, I'm just curious, like, why do we anticipate that we, it's not going to be an issue this summer when it has been an issue in previous summers? Is it because of the storms and we think that there's more of a healthier flow of water. I know that there had also been some efforts in the past with some of the um, water resources to dredge the bottom to help with the blue-green algae situation. Um, so, you know, I, I know this, that wasn't the item discussed today, but that's just something that I think is of interest just because we do have a lot of parks with water. Yeah, yeah. Th this is Lisa Gorgian, uh, Assistant General Manager of Operations. So, yeah, thank you. I, I'm not sure if it's on our agenda for the look ahead. I'll check, but we can certainly come back. Um, the park district did invest in an oxygenation system at Lake Anza. So I think that's helped. And then certainly the weather with um, all of the rain. So we can, we can certainly partner and, and have stewardship also um, part of a presentation. Oh, that's helpful. Maybe, maybe I just need to brief on the oxygenation. That might be helpful to hear. Cause I know that this comes up with Del Val and uh, Shadow, Lake Shadow Cliffs sometimes that those places have been closed because of blue green algae as well. Yeah, we, we certainly can follow up uh, just on some recent efforts at Temescal and then also at, at ANZA to try to address the cyanobacteria. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and similarly, I, I noticed that you're talking about some of the different, you know, water options in terms of the sales of water and trying to move away from single-use plastic, which I think is a really good goal and I think fit, aligns well with our goals here at the Park District. And you know, it's interesting. I'm in this uh, book club and our book last week was about bottled water. So this is a topic um, that's very fresh on my mind. And um, I, I've noticed that a lot of our parks, we do have the water bottle refill stations um, throughout the parks. And I'm guessing we have that at Tilden in some places, but I don't know if it's necessarily near the concessionaires. Um, I wonder if there's some way, and this might be a bigger project and may not be ready since we're getting close to opening for this this summer. But I know that we have so many enthusiasts who really love our parks. And, you know, if there was some way to have availability for sale or as part of the trails challenge to earn, you know, a reusable water bottle that could be encouraged to bring along and to use when they're, you know, swimming at Tilden or at any one of our other parks. So it's, just, it's more of a comment, um, but I, I think that might be something to consider. Yeah, certainly that is a message that we can reinforce and promote. And um, Renee's nodding yes, that there is a water bottle filling station in the vicinity uh, of the snack stand. So yep. that is an amenity that is available. Great, great. Thank you. And then um, can you describe what the soft opening is going to be like? <laughs> Yes, um, I was wondering if Park Supervisor Sarah Motley could speak on the soft opening. We just discussed it this morning, but she's the expert. I'm not really the expert, but I will speak on it. Um, so I've been working with Kyle Maxwell in Lifeguard Services, and um, 
the so the this is the same sort of a plan that apparently they've been doing during all of their open swim seasons here at ANZA, uh, which is we open only on weekends um, for uh, that period of time where it's the soft opening, the April 29th through Memorial Day weekend, 26, I think. And then, um, and then at that point, Memorial Day weekend, then we're open every day of the week. I'm sorry, Dan, did you have something to add? I was gonna say just what you said, uh, the soft, soft opening really is, uh, it's it's really just a limited opening. It's uh, how we open up the swim season traditionally with weekends only and then going to uh, weekday operations during this uh, summer focus. And then originally uh, also, um, I'm assuming, because uh, blue green algae wasn't the only, uh, uh, obstacle to opening the, uh, from last year it was the uh, the beach and the culvert that was eroding the beach. Has that been resolved? Okay. Some good points, uh, Director Rosario. Yes, we had several issues that we were addressing at Lake Anza within the last year. Um, we are uh, compounding, you know, the closures that we had to deal with during COVID. We also had some severe um, storm weather, um, which we continue to have um, during the winter. Um, which caused a plugging of a culvert that runs right underneath the beach, um, which caused some overflow that that was um, caught, ended up causing erosion on the beach. We really needed to address that and address it appropriately through the um, through our, our environmental permitting to make sure that when we're working in the in the you know with a culvert uh, in a waterway uh, in a lake, we wanted to make sure we were. Um, uh, doing all those, that clearing operation appropriately. And so those permits were obtained um, during 2022 and that work was addressed. So the, um, we are going to be able to open the beach again. Um, and um, there was some other damage that occurred with that overflow, including a fence that was damaged that has been, uh, that we've been able to repair. Um, and we have been bringing in sand. So Sarah and her crew have been busy spreading sand on the beach. All those pieces, are, we're happening right on the beach. And then in addition to that, we're gonna be able to uh, introduce our brand new ADA accessible pathway, which um, goes down from the paved parking lot down into the, the facility, um, which has just been very recently completed. I was out there yesterday and the lawn looks terrific and I, I'm sure the public will really enjoy it. Excellent, thank you. And then uh, I think this is uh, this sounds like a a, a great um, collaboration. Having having that same concessionaire run two two places uh, nearby, uh, I think it also uh, speaks well or makes it easier anyway for um, uh, the fact that the concessionaire is familiar with our um, our bookkeeping practices and and our. Um, and so that's that. That's a, another plus. Uh, okay, well done. Any other questions? Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Any? I forgot to ask for the last. Is were there any public comments? There nope. are no public comments on this item. You hate thing. Okay, a motion is in order. Make the motion to approve. Excellent. We have a motion. Second. And we have a second, Dr. Corbett. Denise, can you do a roll call vote, please? Sure. Chair Samuel? Yes. Chair Corbett? Aye. I'm sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> Director Samuel? Yes. Director <laughs> okay. Corbett? Aye. Chair Rosario? Aye. So moved. Unanimous. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. That brings us to um, item number three. Oh no, item number four. Park Operations Shoreline Unit Update. Jeff Manling, welcome. Yeah, welcome. Oh, before you start, um, just to, uh, regarding Director San Wong's um, question about blue green algae, I think this is gonna be on the, um, I think it's on the uh, uh, natural cultural resources committee meeting. We might, we might, if not, we can bring it here. But I think it is going to be there. 
Yeah, I'll check. Okay. All right, test. Okay, good afternoon, Board of Directors. Jeff Manley, Shoreline Unit Manager. And today I'd like to showcase the Shoreline Unit highlights, accomplishments, and challenges. Um, pictured here, as you can see, is uh, Labor Day 2022. We had the perfect storm of uh, triple digit weather. A lot of the swim areas were closed. And uh, of course, Crown Beach and a lot of the shoreline areas were open, including Encinal, Albany, and Keller Beach. Um, with the drought, overcrowding, and as I mentioned, many closures, we, it, was neat, it was good to note we had calls come all the way from Redding, California, wondering if Crown Beach was open. So you knew it was a dire need to get out there uh, and enjoy the, the swimming areas where they could go. And then I also wanted to note, just taught off the press, is just Easter, just to give you um, a recap on that. We, we had record numbers of attendance at Miller Knox and Crown Beach, and just to note, Miller Knox, all the parking areas closed at approximately 10 a.m. on Easter, and then they actually had to close Dornan Drive through the tunnel with coordination with Richmond because the traffic was backing up so bad into the town of Point Richmond. So you could see uh, with all this rain, um, definitely we were really sought after to get those Easter egg hunts and uh, cabin fever. So. Okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the dedicated staff we have in the Shoreline Unit who work really hard to keep parks safe and protect natural resources. And as we're coming out of the pandemic mode, uh, pictured is our first unit meeting since the pandemic. And this was at the John Muir House in 2022 of October last year. Um, our staff has unique challenges we face with increased attendance and upkeep of age facilities. I wanted to give you some staffing updates. As the shoreline unit continues to grow with new facilities and again, increased attendance, I really wanna thank the board support for approving new staff positions and position upgrades through the unit. Uh, we have a new staff that includes McLaughlin East Shore State Park with the Brickyard Gardener and then two Crown Beach Rangers nine to 12 month upgrades in our unit FTEs now. Now we have 46 field positions in the unit and it's really good to note as I look through the unit roster, a lot of the staff have been here for the majority of their careers. So it really goes to show that the Shoreline Unit is a sought after unit to work in. And I also wanna note the Shoreline Unit is unique with a lot of boundaries extending out into the bay, into the water. We take extra measures to protect resources like eelgrass beds in the bay and native bird populations. Most staff, are trained in boom deployment and are also hazardous waste operation and emergency response certified trained. Um, we have a fleet of two spill response trailers. And in those trailers, we have boom, um, probably about a thousand feet of boom per trailer. And just to give you some background, um, maybe some of you may not know this, but uh, the funding for the spill program came from the Costco Busan incident, which happened in 2007. That's where a large ship collided with the Bay Bridge support and it spilled uh, over 53,000 gallons. It was a real, real bad incident. Um, and that went all into the Bay and the big incident command structure came as a result. And from the settlement funds that provided us support, not only for our agency to be proactive with spill response, but throughout the state of California. So these spill response trailers have GPS coordinates and they're located from you know, the border, San Diego, all the way up to Northern California can be deployed on any incident command structure. And just look at the picture here. This was October um, of last year. We had our first boom deployment training since the pandemic. And uh, we have staff, the Surrey Queen is the big boat there. And then we also had Coast Guard participating and California Department of Fish and Wildlife participating and also helping us with the training. So it's a, it's a unified effort in these, uh, these specialized trainings. And then just wanna mention about volunteers. They're a precious resource for Shoreline Unit. We rely heavily on volunteers as internal crews have limited capacity. Volunteers assist in litter, debris removal, uh, weeding monarch gardens, and assisting stewardship 
monitoring and improving the Turn Island habitats at Hayward Shoreline. Pictured to the left on the box is a event that happened in 2022 at an MLK, Martin Luther King Park. And then to the right, we have volunteers helping in the Monarch Garden at Point Pinole. And I just wanted to note, um, Earth Day is Saturday, April 22nd. And the majority of our parks, including Point Pinole, Crown, Martin Luther King, and Hayward Shoreline all have events for that cleanup. And then just from last year, just, uh, just to show how successful it is, Coastal Cleanup happened last September, and it hosted over 892 volunteers who removed over 8,000 pounds of trash, and we were able to utilize 105 pounds into recycling material. So we look forward to these continued efforts to really help our shoreline and uh, decrease the litter amount. And then I just want to showcase some of our special events, um, making a pandemic comeback, including the annual Sandcastle Contest at Crown Beach. Um, this was 2022. So this was one of the first ones to make a comeback. And this year will be the 55th um, Crown Beach Sandcastle Contest held on June 10th. Um, sign up is free. It's on the Alameda website. And it's really fun. It's, uh, it's great for a family of them. And I also want to just kind of highlight and touch on some other special events um, that have been happening. We, we host, you know, several running races that cut through many of our parks. But one um, pictured on the right is the Alameda 10-miler happening in August. And the course starts near the former, former Alameda Naval Base, winds through McKay Avenue, through the trail, down Shoreline Drive. And it's just interesting to see some of the stats. Um, the oldest runner was 79 years old. And the youngest runner was 12 years old. And it's just, yeah, you're never too old or too young to run these events. And it's a great way to bring the community together. And then on the um, bigger picture is the Keller Beach Open Water Bay Swim that happens in September. It's a fundraiser for the Youth USA swim teams. And different open swim courses go up to two miles from Keller Beach. And then our lifeguard service has been... Um, collaborated with this group for the last 13 years, supporting the operation, to make sure it is safe. And I also wanted to touch on joint agency efforts. We do a lot of this in the shoreline unit. Um, you know, many of our borders go up to urban interface with challenging jurisdictions. Um, we work and continue to support city agencies with cleanups to maintain safe trails and resource protection. And I just wanted to show you this trail. Um, it's a great example of collaboration. This is Leet Drive that borders Martin Luther King Park at the San Leandro Creek Trail. And, uh, you know, just to give you an idea of the boundaries that are really unique, and I can verbally kind of say just if you're to face the screen and look on the right side, once you go off the edge of the trail, you head into Leet Avenue, Leet Drive, and that's the city of Oakland. Then you go to the left. You go about 10 feet, it's still our jurisdiction, right to where the trail kind of banks down, and then it goes into flood control. So there are un really unique uh, jurisdictional boundaries there. Um, but a special thanks um, to our land department, legal department, and our police department through working through these agreements where we operate these trails that are kind of uh, almost as old as me, these agreements, and uh, understanding them, and then coordinating joint efforts with the city so we can clean up these trails, make them safe for the public, and also collaborate with the city. So as this is a longer term um, encampment here that we have to kind of manage for the long run. And I want to highlight facility upgrade projects. Uh, many structures in the shoreline unit are reaching um, their age or extensive repairs were needed. So this is the bathhouse building that a new roof put on uh, earlier in the year. And then we also had other new roofs put on at the Doug Side and Visitor Center, Gloria Seas Building, the Board Sports Concession, and the Martin Luther King Park Office. And these re-roofing projects will help extend the lifespan of the buildings for many, many years as the elements work towards uh, <laughs> going the other direction. And then to touch on some ongoing projects, uh, we got right now what's pictured is a Grand Street bathroom at Crown that's under replacement. And then the Park Street restroom was replaced last year. A uh, total of seven bathrooms have been replaced or are under construction, including three restrooms at Point Pinole, Crudo Staging Restroom, and also the Royal Staging. 
area CXT at Lake Delval or others to mention too. And then it's anticipated in the next few years, um, we have two restrooms remaining along Shoreline Drive that need replacement. And then the Kroll's restroom at the visitor center is anticipated to be replaced, replaced with the sewer line upgrade project. And I just wanted to show, yeah, this is kind of what the upgrades are going to look like as you drive down Shoreline Drive in the future. Um, the newer bathrooms are designed to hold up better to the elements, you know, fewer wood components, uh, more concrete, and it'll help with, um, you know, the coastal environment and uh, not being as prone to vandalism as well, which we encounter in the shoreline. Yeah, they, they are really looking nice. Um, other updates um, include long-term projects that have recently been completed, like the Doolittle Staging and San Francisco Bay Trail Extension Project. And I have exciting news. Uh, from design and construction that the fences have been pulled at this project and now the public now has access you know to utilize the staging area the boat ramp and also the F sf bay trail extension and as you can see here the parking lot this was just fresh off the press this morning i took the pictures of these um, and you can see the new boat ramp in the right picture there so it replaces uh just an aged structure um nice nice concrete boat ramp uh resurface parking area and all the um, good drainages out there that'll help out. And it's a well-used um, facility. Um, it, was, uh, it was within the last few days. So yeah, the soft opening. So they, they just coordinate with the contractor on, you know, it's uh, not exact, but uh, pulling the fence. And the caveat is they still have some work to do out there, but we're able to at least open it up and get the public out there to enjoy it. And I think um, I just wanted to note about the boat ramp before I <laughs> head to the last slide is that before, when this was closed, we received multi, lots and lots of calls about the boat ramp because it's uh, understandable. It's a nice calm water to launch into. And there's very actually few boat launch, public boat launch facilities around that area. So it's nice to get that back in service. And then the SF Bay Trail segment, um, I just wanted to note on that one. Um, it has the crash barrier there, of course, so it's a safe path to travel along Doolittle Drive, which is great for the users. And um, you know, basically, you can go from Doolittle Drive to party and kind of link into MLK Park now, which is really nice. And I, I think there will be a lot of users on that, especially joggers, bikers, and even commuters being so close to Oakland Airport. Let's see, yeah, on fleet upgrades. Um, I just wanted to note parks continue to experience the year round usership. And along with that, we have our maintenance and upkeep that just keeps increasing. And we've been working really hard on, uh, it's called right sizing the fleet and making more versatile and efficient or adding more versatile and efficient equipment to the unit. Uh, the vehicle on the left is a Toro Workman that was purchased for Miller Knox Park. The workman has multiple connections and power to pull turf maintenance equipment behind it. That's essential for the operations at Miller Knox and many other parks. Uh, the workman also provides a safer option. As we see now, driving regular park trucks on park pathways in busy situations, it's just not working anymore. So this has better visibility, an open cab, a little larger bed than a regular park uh, Kawasaki mule. And it also, you can utilize, say you do turf in the morning, you can shift it over to doing garbage in the afternoon. It's a really versatile piece of equipment. And then I also want to highlight the generator on the right. Um, this is a new replacement for Point Pinole. And some of you may know this, uh, it's uh, Point Pinole is one of the few service yards that doesn't have a regular power hookup. So we have to utilize a generator. Um, and that generator had a lot of hours on it. So with this new one, will have more efficiency and uh, lower emissions as they improve these generators over every generation. And just a note again, um, newer equipment making more efficiency in the shoreline unit. As we added some small skid steers in the last few years, uh, it'll save hours, it's been saving hours of staff time as we use the right piece of equipment and we could utilize our staff hours on other focuses. And not only does it have a bucket for scraping the pathway, we have other um, implements like augers for doing fence holes and uh, trenchers for doing irrigation line and so on. 
Then I want to note on the seasonal challenges, as we've seen in the storms um, that just kept going on and on, we've had large debris loads come up on the bay and uh, staff continue to remove and develop debris piles for these that have helped make the beach areas ready for the heavy use that happen on Easter and into the summer. Um, our challenges though uh, include, it's not just driftwood, but we've got telephone poles, um, tires, medical waste, and we've been having to deal with those, putting them in separate piles and working with our risk department for separate haul out. But uh, yeah, we're working our way through the debris, but I think throughout the year, we'll still get more rolling in as we get uh, different tidal action and winds. And I also wanted to add, you know, we, we are adapting to change. Um, as you've seen, we've, we've been experiencing more intense storms, higher tides, greater winds that have been kind of shifting here and there. Um, and that's, you know, that shifts our need to uh, improve shoreline resiliency. Um, you know, planning department, they continue to collaborate on efforts and plan into the future. Um, you know, this includes the SF Bay Trail risk assessment and adaptation prioritized, prioritization plan. I'll say that out in there a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, and that was completed in 2020, but really what it focused on was um, SF Bay Trail segments that are at higher risk for sea level rise. You know, they always look at the 2050. So, you know, looking at that plan, at least, you know, we got pieces that we're putting together and looking into the future. And we also have our Oakland Alameda Estuary Sea Level Rise Group, which we have planning involved with and also operations with stakeholders from cities around and communities and see if Alameda's lead on that with district participating. So we're looking into the future, you know, hopefully we'll get some better planning and understanding what, what we need to implement in the future. And design and construction have also implemented sea level rise into future project design, especially with active transportation and trail networks. And again, this picture was me uh, when one of the storms hit on Friday, on a Friday, and it just, this doesn't, I wish I had a video, but I mean, the water was splashing over that pathway. It was just the intensity of this was uh, pretty amazing to show. And just a note, um, protecting the shorelines. You know, our annual sand moving project was completed late February and rental equipment moved over 15,000 cubic yards. The sand migrates by tidal and with wind action to north and south ends of the beach. And then it's captured by these cement groin walls, they call them. Um, they act like catcher's mitts. And then we use the equipment to bring the sand back mid beach and redistribute. And really, I want, I want to recognize a few folks. Uh, Dave Rinche, who is also known as Doc Quack, without his efforts and the biomonitoring, we would have had to make sand moving move into probably later May or June because of our friends, the snowy plovers. They're this cute little beautiful bird that shows up on the beach uh, every year. And that's been happening since 2014. But what, what makes them really unique in managing this beach is uh, they're federally protected and can't be disturbed. So with having Dave in place and uh, some areas cordoned off, we we're able to still achieve our sand moving in February. And then also recognizing roads and trails staff and Crown Beach Park operations staff. We were flexible with the scheduling because again, we have no control on the tides and uh, it just worked. Uh, we had to work some weekend days in February to make it happen, but uh, appreciate everybody's efforts. And uh, it was a successful event this year. And just a note on ongoing challenges, uh, not only do we get uh, driftwood debris, but we get boat debris sometimes on the shoreline. Um, boats are unique because uh, some of them have a liveaboard story to them, some of them no owner, and then they end up on our shoreline. And we, maritime law, as talking about public safety, it's about a 10 day notice, depending on the situation. And during that notice, we could have more tidal action that can actually wreck the boat more, or somebody can hop on the boat and start living aboard it, or it can be vandalized. And that makes the situation tricky because our goal is always to, if it's, if we have to take on the boat, is to have a salvage operation, float the boat out, take it away. So, and the majority usually gets salvaged, but uh, in this picture in Hayward Shoreline, it was a happy ending because uh, one night it was there, then the next night it was gone. So yeah, yeah, and hopefully it's in a nice boat dock area and yeah, the owner's happy too. <laughs> yeah, I always love happy endings. And then this picture says it all, um, a beautiful sunset at Arrowhead Marsh. Uh, I just want to know that note the shoreline is an ever-changing environment, and staff continue their efforts to maintain facilities, 
provide great services to the visitors and protect the natural resources. And I just want to thank board members for allowing me this time to provide the shoreline unit updates and have some time for some questions. So thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Questions, uh, Director Sanwa. Yeah, I think this might be one of the presentations where I learned the most new things. So thank you for this update. It was really helpful mm -hmm. to hear about some things that I had never really considered before, but I am familiar with, you know, when you talk about some of the debris that um, might arrive at the shoreline and how we at the park district have to manage that and be prepared. Um, you know, we were talking about some of the hazardous waste, like medical waste and that you work with, did you say the risk department within the park district? So we have a group. Yes. Is that within operations also or no, no, no. it's a different division. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe we also have some contractors if it's a really big kind of situation. I know sometimes that can happen too with different types of waste. Um, yes. Uh, let me see if I have questions. Um, thanks for also reviewing all the events. I found that to be very inspirational. You know, I, of course I know that Earth Day is this month, but I hadn't even really thought about what I might be doing on Earth Day. So obviously I'm going to be going to an East Bay Regional Park event. So now I need to go look at what events we'll be having and figure out which one's the best one to go to. So maybe that's something um, to try to figure out. Uh, so, so, so thank you for that inspiration. I think sometimes, you know, the calendar creeps up on us and we don't really think about, you know, what we're going to be doing in a few weeks or that it's actually going to be Earth Day in a few weeks. And even hearing about the um, open water swim in September, I'm, I'm thinking, gosh, I should try to you know, prepare and maybe do something like that. That could be fun too. So thanks for including that as part of this um, presentation. I, I don't believe I have any questions, or I guess I do have one question. So I think earlier we had a presentation on the lakes division. Is that correct? At the beginning of Mm -hmm. this year. And I think it was when we were still um, able to do this remote because I had my nice uh, organizational chart for the operations division that I keep in my home office. And I'm realizing listening to this presentation, I don't have it in front of me. Um, just to review, so with the shoreline unit versus the lakes division, I believe the lakes division I know has Coyote Hills as part of the lakes division and is a big break part of lakes division. So as part of shoreline it or, is part of the Delta unit. The Delta unit. Okay. Yes. yes thank you. Um, I think I'm going to need to bring that uh, helpful or chart with me the next time I come here. <laughs> with. I mean, this this is the largest division within the park district, right? Operation. So it is one to definitely continue to review from me, at least as a new person. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Great. Right. Director Corbett. I could talk for an hour, <laughs> <laughs> but I won't do that. So impressive, so um, amazing to see the work that you're doing. And, you know, all of the park district has amazing uh, spaces for people to have a good time and protect the environment. But the fact that you have so much shoreline is, is quite impressive and hard work. And obviously, you, um, you know, you work really hard on issues that, you know, get, uh, you have to turn around and pick up on them after a storm. Right, just that one photo you were showing of the the, the bay coming in into the shoreline. So uh, very, very impressive all the work that you do, and um, the fact that you are so committed to that. Everybody doesn't get uh, boats floating into the park district or some of those endangered species that uh, we need to take care of. And so it's just a lot of extra important. Everybody does extra important things, but it's very impressive. This. Uh, presentation that you just gave to us. Um, let's see, uh, do I have some questions? Uh, well, first of all, let me say, uh, please make sure you say thank you to everybody for all the extra work they're doing because of the, you know, uh, the water from the bay coming up and hitting parts of our park districts and uh, impacting them. And also, especially just if we just talk, stop for a moment and think about Easter Day right? And all the people that were working so hard and they have family things too, um, yet they're um, making sure everything looks good. So please thank them for all that great work they're doing during the times of the year. And obviously we have some great events coming up. The Sandcastle event is always so much fun. 
and um, uh, clean up days, April 22nd, that's just right around the corner. So many things coming up. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm particularly interested in continuing to follow what's going on with the Martin Luther King area and all the new construction that was done. Uh, so many people who have used that part of the park district for many, many years have grown up in those neighborhoods. So they're very appreciative of what was done. So thank you for that too. And let's see. I could say lots of many, many things, but it's obvious just uh, this presentation. And I'd love to have a copy of the um, printed presentation that you just did. I'd love to have that to help share with constituents in that area. Um, the San Leandro Cherry Festival Parade will be coming up soon. So I'll be asking you if you can be involved with that as well. And also um, Fourth of July will be coming up as well. And it's always nice to have um, uh, folks from our park district out there showing off the people. People get so excited when they see the, see the, the park district uh, vehicles and the people marching through. So thank you, it's quite impressive. And there's so many other things I could talk about, but. That was quite an impressive uh, presentation. Thank you for all your good hard work and please tell everybody else thank you too. Yeah, thank you. And I'll get a hard copy for you. Thank you for the so presentation. Much. Yeah, very impressive work you're doing. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, well done. Um, I think most of my questions got answered, but I, uh, and I wanna appreciate um, um, the opening of Doolittle Drive because um, You've seen the emails. <laughs> uh, so it really does um, uh, alleviate some of the complaints from some constituents who had, who had trouble with accessing the, the water. And so uh, that's great. Uh, that's really good news. And then um, the picture with the homeless and was the uh, San Leandro Creek track, uh, San Leandro Creek Trail East. Yes. Is that east of Hagenberger? It is, it's on the east, yeah, it's funny, but it's on the east side of the San Leandro Creek channel because there's actually a San Leandro Creek trail, which right. I'll, which is runs on the west side, but this is the east side okay. and runs towards Arrowhead yeah, Marsh. Yeah, to where that was. Yes, yeah, right on Hagenberger there or off of it. So when the uh, homeless encampments encroach on our trail, we notify the city of Oakland or? We coordinate, I mean, each, each situation, um, you know, it's different. different. Yeah. But uh, what we usually do is work through our public safety department and they actively reach out to Oakland's public safety department, which, you know, and also they have a unhoused outreach that works with the community right there on Leak Drive. So it's a it's a bigger coordinated effort on the cleanups, but and also city of Oakland, who, you know, it, it doesn't happen on a scheduled yeah. run, but they usually go in and you know, work on cleanups in that area okay, for, good. for safety. And then um, uh, I'm hoping our, our staff is, um, is uh, continuing to stay safe in their interactions with, with, the, um, with that homeless population. So um, I thought there was one other question. Oh, um, regarding Damon Slough, I, there was an article recently in the Alameda patch about uh, different uh, strategies of, um, uh, trapping um, litter in in the Damon Slough, especially, and uh, I'll forward that to you. And, and I gave it to um, I think I forwarded that article to uh, to Katie Hornback to look out to see if there's any uh, possibilities of um, uh, grants that would allow for uh, maybe implementing some of those strategies. I'll send it to you and see if it's something that um, staff would consider. And then also. Um, one of our, one of your one of our constituents who actively cleans one of the uh, booms up there uh, by uh, he goes on a kayak and he picks up the litter along the booms and he was uh, asking if there's a better a better location for the second the, the boom further stop he says that one's really hard to access uh, yeah, take a look at it and see see what 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 uh, staff thinks if there's a, a better location. That makes it easier for um, for a volunteer on, on a kayak to, to pick up that litter, or uh, and maybe um, uh, maybe when we 
when I send you that article and take, take a look at these different the strategies for uh, trapping litter, maybe there's something else we can do. But I really appreciate the, uh, all the efforts there. And then um, what's the, uh, regarding point phenol, do we know, we know that's going to be, it's planned. Do we know when it's going to start? Um, we can, I'll follow, I have um, uh, Ken and uh, who's the AGM of Acquisition Stewardship and Development and, and Ren acting chief of design and construction uh, follow up with you. I think my impression is that um, they're wrapping up the Coyote Hill service yard and then kind of lessons learned from that because they're using that as the model to then um, put, put that in at Point Pinole using that same design that we've now purchased yeah. from the architects. Great. Yeah. Uh, cause I, I know it's on the work plan for this year to initiate it, great. but, but things shift to, you know, um, I think they want to make sure that they're not, um, they want to really have it, the learning get incorporated from Coyote Hills. So we don't repeat mistakes mm -hmm. or make sure that successes we repeat. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, I just think this uh, the situation at Point Penol has been a travesty for way too long. Uh, the fact that that service has been running on generators for decades now, and uh, it's crazy. And uh, the sooner we, we get that uh, a permanent service yard that it deserves and, and uh, the crew deserves, then the better. So, um, and then I think... All I have, but yes, um, please uh, let everybody on, on your crews to, uh, that the board appreciates all the work they've been doing. And also a shout out to Dave Mackey. Uh, he gave a great presentation to the um, uh, Alameda Liaison Committee, and uh, we we're grateful for that. He answered a lot of questions. <laughs> That's great. I'll, I'll pass those thanks along. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Any other comments or are there any uh, public comments? There are no public comments on this item. Okay. Director Corbett. Question. Yes. Um, on the Martin 16 new uh, facilities, parking area and, uh, you know, access into the water and all that, um, is there going to be um, some sort of uh, opening event? Yeah, thank you, Director Corbett. I'm glad you asked. I'm, I wanted to just clarify with that when... Um, that Susan Shu, our uh, AGM of Public Affairs, we just learned um, yesterday that the fencing came down. And so she was just made aware. And so she will be coordinating with the directors, you certainly, and, and all of our funding partners um, on, a, on a, a dedication for that. So, so that, that sort of falls in Susan's um, public affairs realm to coordinate that. And so she will definitely be reaching out um, to you on that. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. I've been hearing from a lot of people when would that opening happen? And they'll be able to say, oh, yesterday or the day before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So but you, they'll be happy to see that and uh, we'll have an opportunity to uh, celebrate. To really it. celebrate it. Yeah. And yeah. it would be nice to include the Martin Luther King Club um, that uh, used that facility uh, a lot down, has their events down outside and someday would like to do. Building the shoreline center, time with yeah. The cafeteria. yeah, yeah. So, I think that that's great feedback to share with Susan as you're um, helping to inform that that dedication. Could you officially let her know to get a hold of me? So, I can... well, she, yes, she said she would be reaching out yesterday. Okay, so, good. yeah, okay. yeah, you're okay. on her list. I think. Okay, good, good. good. <laughs> Thank you. It's looking, <laughs> it's looking great, though. So impressive. Please tell everybody thank you. I know they worked so hard. Definitely. All right. Thank you, board members. Denise, are there yes, any yes, we do have one public comment. I will be Great. admitting Mr. Brunero. Good afternoon, Mr. Brew. Your three minutes starts now. Thank you. Um, 
I'd just like to ask that these uh, that you as as members of the board of directors that you really work hard to stay on top of what's happening out there with the operations of your of of the park district and what's happening in your parks. Um, for example, when I go to the Pleasanton Ridge Park, there's a foothill staging area. That's the major main staging area there, and. Um, it shows as being open on your website. But when I go to Google Maps, it shows as the road is closed. It's closed for a couple of miles right there. So I'm kind of doubting that you're that anybody can actually get into Pleasanton Ridge. And I sort of believe that uh, your website is wrong, that the P Foothill staging area at Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park is actually not working. And uh, you know we need to get this stuff straightened out. Um, and uh, also uh, over here, um, there's uh, the park district is, uh, I, last I checked, and this is again, a responsibility of the board of directors, is operating under the emergency authority that was given to the general manager uh, three months ago. And at that time, President Coffey said the board received a letter from Spal Sparl Def and the Sierra Club. They were in opposition to this emergency authority. Norm LaForce, opposed it since it could be open to a lot of abuse on both sides. I'm just reading from the minutes of the meeting. Jim Hansen opposed because it would give general manager broad and unlimited uh, unlimited authorization. Robin Mitchell said that giving that given the board meets twice a month doesn't appear to be any need for this amendment. Um, and I'm kind of wondering since it's been three months and the tone of today's meeting is that every, your your staff is working through all these emergencies, you know, Cleaning up the the mess and uh, and and picking up the pieces and getting things ready to open up for the summer. You know the tone of happy optimism that we've been hearing for the last uh, uh, hour or two. Um, if if that's the case, it doesn't sound like you know you're uh, like there's much of an emergency going on outside of Pleasanton Ridge. And my question would be, what are you doing to um, get past the state of emergency? And uh, by the way, there they are. There were supposed to be. Did anything happen? Were any actions taken under the state of emergency? You know, you should be hearing about those within the next three months because uh, under the the authorization that you gave, um, you will be you will hear what happened within six months of the action that was taken. So it'll be reported back to you. So that's um, you know we we only have a, another three months to wait for that. So yeah, the, uh, I really think that this board needs to get out there and 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 see what's happening under the emergency status, see what's happening at Pleasanton Ridge Foothill staging area, and see what's happening on the website and try to get everything you know sorted out so that we can get the right information out here to us people who are trying to you know visit parks and uh, so we get the straight straight dope. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Any other comments from the board? And I'll ask the assistant GM. Okay, wonderful. I um, just for the GM comments, I wanted to give another quick slide update of of some of the storm damages from March because um, it's exciting. It's some of it is getting resolved, but it you know pictures say a thousand words, so really I think helps describe that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. transition in a second. There we go. Okay. In slow motion. So, um, and I do have uh, Chief of Park Operations, Steve Castile is also on. And so, um, and then of course, Jeff is still here. So we just, you know, we continue to share updates that trees are down um, and trails are closed. And so that's a very dynamic process where um, park, park staff, park supervisors are reaching out to, uh, we have a distribution list, trail closure distribution list that is then updated um, by our web uh, master uh, so we have um, Nicola is there constantly, you know, every day there's notes saying tree is down, this part of the trail is closed, we update the website. 
they're able to get emergency crews in to remove the trees. Then we update the website saying um, the trail is now open. Um, we did just hear about one of the um, parks uh, that had been identified as being closed and open, closed. It's it's Pleasanton Ridge is now open, so that that has been updated. So it's open on the website because it shows on the website it's open because it is now open. So um, sometimes that you know where folks are calling in from the field, they have to get a you know webmaster has to update it. So there's sometimes it's not like uh, you know, second by second being updated, but we really try our best to be have timely information for the community who are utilizing these so they can make good choices about where they're going to go. Um, at Crown Beach, you can see this is sort of after the waves retreat. This is an example of where, you know, just like a claw came in and took away that sand. This is again at Crown Beach. This is one of the trees that fell. I, there was, I think, a previous photo of of in the um, visitor center where that tree kind of got split in half. Here's another example. And then Brooks Island, the Brooks Island dock, you can see it's coming away. Um, this is part of the shoreline unit. So I think Jeff provided this. We were out at Del Val uh, on a nice sunny day, but this is sort of what it looked like back in March uh, when the water was very high. And then at Redwood Canyon Golf Course. So this is the first tee on the left and just reading the notes on the right. Um, the third tee, you can see this silt gets brought up and it's um, nothing can grow. It has to get scraped off. It can't, it has to be placed and then and, and then really removed. So it's a, quite a big effort. Um, and then again, this is looking towards the, um, the structure you can see in white, that's the bridge, the archway bridge to the wedding venue there. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the 18th fairway that just looks like a lake. And then this is just another example that we're seeing throughout the district where um, I had, had never heard this term entrenchment, um, but you know we're really seeing the earth, a lot of lot of earth movement. So, and um, those are. I think that's the end. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and did want to mention um, we do have we have Steve Castile, and we also have um, Steve Harker from. Um, Wait, did he go away? Where is he? Nope, there he is. Steve Harker is still here. Uh, he is our concessionaire with Touchstone with uh, for the Redwood Canyon Golf Course. Um, so I thought it, he could share a little bit more. We are um, going to be bringing forward an item um, to um, to the board uh, regarding uh, to amend our agreement with with Touchstone, um, we, the goal is we really wanna assist um, the concessionaire with repairs that are required to reopen. They, they haven't been able to reopen yet because of all the storm damage. And so um, that's something that we'll be bringing forward. It's a it's, um, little bit out of sequence. We, we did speak with the general manager about um, skipping, bringing it here and just bringing it straight to the full board, just given, um, the assessments that have been going on and coordinating with um, uh, the FEMA, uh, meeting with FEMA and find, trying to understand what's covered and not covered and kind of doing those assessments. So you will see something come um, at the next board meeting, but um, I just wanted to, to flag that. It's, 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 it's probably out of the damage that we've seen. We, we have the DelVal docks. We have... Um, this we have, uh, or the Del Val Marina. We have Redwood Canyon Golf Course. We have the Myers Garden. Those are um, some of the the high, and then of course the Doncaster Dock that just went, you know, down over the spillway. So those are sort of the big ticket items that we're seeing. So I just wanted to share that, share that this morning, and then I will 
um, if it's okay, I'll, I'll ask if Steve Castile or Steve Harker would want to add anything. Um, I see maybe Steve Harker, do you want, since we're talking about Redwood Canyon, do you, would you want to introduce yourself thank, and say a few words? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Steve Harker, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Touchstone Golf, and uh, we're the uh, operator for not only Redwood Canyon Golf Course, but also Tilden Park Golf Course, which fared a lot better uh, throughout the storms. Um, you know, golf is a is a sport that's played in all kinds of conditions, and I'm sure we would have had golfers out there if it wasn't for the fact that uh, the silt that Lisa described washed over the golf course and has to be removed. Unfortunately, we can't grow grass in that material. And since the storms continued throughout uh, March and even into early April, uh, we've had to start over a number of times. Uh, right now, we're very pleased with the forecast and the outlook, and we're working hand in hand with uh, Ruby and with Steve Castile on our plans to seed the golf course. We still have some silt to remove, then we will seed it, and then we will work to get a nice, consistent turf base for the golfers and reopen as quickly as we can. So Steve, um, uh, what do you, where do you have to um, you have to haul out that silt? Where do you where do you haul it to? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, uh, Director Rosario. We uh, we had a, a location on the golf course earmarked for the cleaning of the channel, which is a project that Jeff Rasmussen is leading, and that project is tied to some flooding that occurred in 2017. So we've been putting it in that particular spot. So we, we may need to find another spot uh, when the uh, project to, to regrade the channel is going. So we're putting it there and then we have it in a few other spots uh, on the golf course, but that's the primary spot. It's about, uh, we were estimating, and it's only an estimate that it's about uh, 10,000 cubic yards of dirt, that a uh, silt that we were, were remove, moving. Um, the last couple storms, uh, fortunately, didn't deposit as much as the initial storms, so we probably have about 2,000 yards left. Hi, uh, yes. Um, so I, I'm familiar with some of the, I guess, I have to summarize it, the flood management strategies within the Tri-Valley area right next to Castro Valley. And I know we have at least two golf courses that were built in areas that were um, set up for, you know, larger flood overflow in terms of major events. And the two golf courses specifically that I'm talking about are Las Positas Golf Course in Livermore mm -hmm. at the end of um, Cottonwood Creek and then um, Castlewood golf course, the, the lower golf course near um, the Arroyo de la Laguna. And uh, my, my question is, you know, because I, I, I've heard a little bit about uh, all the challenges you've been facing in this most recent um, storm series, we'll call it. And uh, just at a high level in terms of flood management, and it sounds like there was some um, issues back in 2017 when we had our previous major storm event. Is Redwood Canyon Golf Course in an area that also has been um, sort of designated for some storm overflow in a similar, similar way that Las Positas Golf and Castlewood Golf, the lower course, are um, set up? Do we know? Uh, okay. Yes, the property is actually owned by East Bay Mud and then leased to the East Bay Regional Park District and then in turn leased to us. And it, uh, the Upper San Leander Reservoir uh, feeds down through a creek. There's a couple creeks that lead into San Leander Creek, which then goes to Lake Chabot. And then from Lake Chabot, the water goes out into the ocean. So it is anticipated uh, that there is and will be flooding at this golf course. Uh, what is unfortunate is that the process to get the repairs done from the previous uh, flooding in 2017 have yet, yet to be completed. And that includes securing the bridges and widening the channel and getting the cubic feet per second through the channel up to uh, a level of over 200 
Um, but even in even with those even with the completion of those projects, there still would be some level of flooding. Okay, but that, that's helpful. Thank you so much. And I, I will add, it's not uncommon for golf courses to, to be in this situation. It's a common use of land. The, the challenge that we've had is the amount of silt. That's the challenge. Dr. Corbett. Thank you. I, I just wanted, uh, you just brought that up, Steve. I just wanted to mention you've been working for a few years now to uh, protect this part of the land the area where the, where the golf course is and also the open space land. And uh, we appreciate the fact that you are, um, you know, obviously someone who works, works hard to protect this stuff and, and get it doing better. So, um, you know, I, I know we're working hard to help you with what's going on and we're also I know I know us and this committee is interested in helping you in whatever ways we can so um you know thank you for being so um you know you're just you're dedicated <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just started happening oh well, yes director <laughs> you're very Corbett. dedicated thank you very hard yeah Dir director Corbett thank you for those comments yes we are there is no one more committed to uh, the success of your golf courses than we are. And we, obviously we have a stake in that, um, but we're very passionate about the game and the recreation. And it's been growing in popularity since the pandemic and people just love Redwood Canyon golf course um, and are passionate about it uh, and can't wait for it to be reopened. And we, we appreciate uh, the East Bay Regional Park District support in, in that endeavor. Yeah, and we appreciate working with you too. So thank you very much for all you're doing. Thank you. Yes, well, we're grateful that you're willing to uh, stick it out. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a tough one, and there's no yeah. doubt it's it's challenging. But uh, you know, the park is not without uh, challenges as well. We understand that uh, you know these storms really put us all in a difficult position and. And together we're working through it. And um, Steve, would you like? To yeah, add? just along those lines, um, Steve Harker and James and Sam from Redwood Canyon Golf Course out of Touchstone Golf. They've uh, been fantastic partners to work with. Um, they, uh, you know, have undertaken two significant major floods within the last six years that they've been there. Um, I looked at the flows of water that came in with the sedimentation off this last system and uh, the capacities generally, just to give you an idea, anything over 75, you know, give it feet per second down that stream that hasn't been dredged in years is a lot of water. We were at over 700 cubic feet per second on the overflow portions uh, from some of the reports that we saw. So it was an exceedingly amount of water coming down there uh, with the sedimentation on there. So just basically acting as quick as they did to get the excess silt and everything off of the fairways and uh, you know stockpiled and then bermed up on the sides of the creek and all that and off of the turf uh, is greatly going to you know it really helped to improve the overall conditions and get it back up and running. So can't say enough about the work that they've already done. It's it's really been a huge effort. Thank you. We will be going to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, in a little bit, and we certainly know that you'll be giving us information on what we should be asking for. But think of it, anything else you would like to uh, provide to us that we can share, see if we can get more support on the work that's needed. We'd, we'll, we'd appreciate uh, doing that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Director Sanwa? Yeah, I want to build upon that Director Corbett's point too, um, because I imagine you're not, you know, I just gave two other examples of two other nearby golf courses. And I imagine, you know, there's probably more than three golf courses <laughs> that have probably experienced similar damage since, since it is true, a number of golf courses do tend to get um, placed in a, in a location for potential overflow of storm waters. And so I don't know if there's any sort of, um, you know, association that's helping to bring some of the different golf course operators together, but 
you know, that there is some power in numbers. So any information you have to share with us can also, you know, help us as we work together on this. And it is true, you know, golf is a very popular recreation sport. And I think similar to my earlier point about, you know, our equestrian enthusiasts, there are certainly many golf enthusiasts out there. And I think that that just shows, you know, the broad, like, portfolio of recreational opportunities that we have available across East Bay. Yeah, we can we can help coordinate with Steve and and um, and Ruby to to provide information. So thank you. And um, one other follow up from earlier, you had uh, inquired about um, the cyanobacteria, sort of an update. And so I did. Um, Ken Wysocki did say there will be a presentation that's scheduled for natural cultural resources on. Um, the lake management and how to address that. And there was a presentation last year, um, Airdem pulled that up from um, in April from the Natural Cultural Resource. So I think it's an annual uh, presentation that they do. So we can certainly send that to you. Um, and then you can, we can sort of confirm that date of, of when the next presentation will be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Director Corbett. I have one more thing. Since we were talking about going to Washington, D.C., we want to make sure that we um, have the, the information to share on the shoreline and the issues we are dealing with, and, and we need help on, too. So we have plenty of <laughs> issues we need to talk about while we're back, back there. So if you can get that information to us in a way we can present it, that would be great. Okay. Th yes, thank you. thank you. And then... Uh... I know I've asked this for the um, update on the uh, um, or the status of the uh, analyst analysis of the uh, roads and trails. Uh, yeah, was was it was roads and trails and asphalt and yeah, yeah, paving yes. study. Yeah, so I think that uh, report has been given to the general manager, so she has that. Look forward to seeing that. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions or comments? Direct, yes, Director Senwa. I know I mentioned that this at the previous board meeting, but I just want to also take a moment to thank you for the coordination of the DelVal site visit. I thought that that was such an important day. It was, you know, my first site visit as a member of the board. I had attended some previous ones um, as a member of the PAC, the Park Advisory Committee, but I, I thought it was a really um, informative day and I know I personally learned a lot and I think it was good for us to all be out there and we did have a great day in terms of weather. It was beautiful and I will pass that along to Tiffany and Andrea and all of the park everybody it was a it was a very well coordinated uh, and it was a beautiful day. Thank you. Great saying uh, any other comments? No? We're good. With that I think we are adjourned.